and thank you for coming along this evening to the seminar on playful parenting. As you know, the events are made possible through your PTO membership funds. So if you haven't already renewed your membership for this school year, please remember to go online to hollistonpto.org and renew for as little as $20 a year. I'd also like to thank our co-sponsor with this event, CPAC, Special Education Parent Advisory Council. They've provided some funding, so thank you to CPAC. In a moment, I'll hand over to Dr. Lawrence Cohen, who's a psychologist in children's play and play-based therapy. He'll give you some practical advice on how to have fun with your child while connecting with them, to increase their confidence and resolve problems through play. Then Mrs. Gleason, our assistant principal here at Placentino, will introduce a pilot scheme that's currently in the curriculum at Placentino. This is very exciting for us as it builds on the support and supports the work that the PTO has been doing in adding creativity to our classrooms following the screenings of Most Likely to Succeed, which some of you may have seen. It shows great collaboration between the parents and the teachers, so we're very thrilled to have Mrs. Gleason here for that one. Then we'll ask Mrs. Parker, a kindergarten teacher who's actually in one of the pilot classrooms, to join our speakers for a question and answer session. We will have a hard close today at 9 p.m., so if we do run out of time and you haven't managed to ask your question, then please take an index card from the registration desk, leave it in the basket, and I'll do my best to get an answer for that in, you in the coming days. Dr. Cohen has also authored several books. In particular, we're talking about playful parenting this evening. Some of his books are available for sale outside after the event. If you prefer, we do have two copies of Playful Parenting at the Holliston Public Library for your convenience. So please take a moment to silence your phones and enjoy the evening. Thank you. Um, uh, most of what I'll be talking about um, this evening will have to do with connection, connecting with our children, helping our children connect with their own emotions and connect with learning in a different way. And so I wanted to share with you a story that really started me on the road to thinking about connection at the heart of parenting. And this road started with a toy gun. And my daughter was about six years old, and her friend Sam came over to play, and he immediately found the only toy gun that we had in the house, which was uh, a squirt gun. And it was in the closet behind a bunch of stuff, but he had a radar, he went right for it. And he came out, and I was sitting on the couch reading the newspaper, and he came at me and he aimed this squirt gun at me. And I could tell he had seen the movies and played the video games and stuff. He had the stance and the look and this gun. And I, I knew the gun wasn't loaded, the water gun, so I hadn't heard the water running. And so I thought, well, let me just sort of play with this a little bit. Um, my daughter didn't really do this kind of gun play. So I thought, oh, this is interesting. I'll see what I can do. So I said, oh, Sam, you found the love gun. And he was a little bit surprised at this and suspicious. And I said, what? And I said, oh, yeah, when I get shot with a love gun, I have to love the person up who shot me. And he said, I don't know. And he's looking at the gun and looking at me and looking at the gun and looking at me. And then finally he makes up his mind and he shoots me with the gun. And I get up off the couch and I start chasing him and missing. It's one of my favorite games, chase and miss, because it prolongs the game and it helps the child really feel like you really want them. And so <clears throat> I was saying, I love you, I love you. And he's laughing and laughing. And he drops the gun and runs away. I go chasing after him. And my daughter comes out and says, what's going on? I said, Sam shot me with a love gun. And now I have to love him up. And so um, she's a very smart kid. She went, she, you know, she never heard of the love gun. But she went and got the gun. And she shot me with it. And I started singing Close to You by the Carpenters to them, uh, which will date me, I guess. But, um, so they're shooting me with a gun and then saying, stop loving me, stop loving me. But they're laughing and laughing. We're having a great time doing this. And after about 20 minutes or so, they get bored. They go off to do something else. I go back to the newspaper. And um, you can tell how long ago this was. I was sitting with the newspaper. And, um, and I forgot all about it. And then a few weeks go by. And Sam comes over again. He goes straight to the closet, gets the gun, comes out, aims it at me. And I said, don't aim that gun at me, even a toy gun. You should never aim it at anyone. 
And he said, but it's the love gun. It's like, oh, right, so it's the love. So we played the whole game again. And I was determined this time not to forget um, because it really said something to me about no matter what children look like, they always want to connect and need to connect. And then in fact, it's us parents who are often not in the mood to reconnect. Often there's been a problem and they're ready to reconnect and we're not really ready yet. So we really have to find that, that desire to reconnect with them. And we have to read under the surface of their behavior. So whether they're kicking the cat or punching the little sister or refusing to go to school or refusing to do their homework or uh, whatever it is, underneath there is a need and a desire to connect. So um, I told the story. I was at a lecture at a school in Brookline where I live, and um, I told this story. And the next day, I get a frantic call from a mom. And she said, you have to help me. My son's not able to connect. So I thought, that's really serious. I better check it out. So we made an appointment. I, I used to do a lot of home visits at that time. So I went over to their house. And um, he's jumping up and down on his bed. And I say to him, I'll call him Ben. I say to him, so Ben, let's you and me connect. So of course, this is not his language. He doesn't know what that means. So I gave a bunch of examples. I said, we could shake hands. We could have a high five. We could bow to each other. We could tell each other jokes. So he ignores me gets off his bed, goes over to his Lego box, he had a lot of Legos, and he gets two little Lego men. And he hands one to me. So I have no idea what's going on, but I was trained as a play therapist, and basic rule is follow the child and whatever they're doing, you just go along with it and do it, and don't ask too many questions. So I took my guy, and he had his guy, and he took his Lego man and he put the arms out like this. So I don't know what's going on, but I take my Lego guy and I put the arms out like that. And then he holds out his Lego man, and I hold out my Lego man, and our Lego men shake hands with each other. And I think this is really sweet. I look over to his mom, and I see this look, which obviously means, you see what I mean? He, he doesn't know how to connect. So I'm thinking, I'll talk to her later, privately. So I say to the boy, to Ben, how about you and your mom connect? So he, he gets off the bed, and he turns his back to her. She was sitting in a chair here. He turns his back to her and walks as far away as he can get in the room from her. So I'm thinking, this is unusual. And then he starts going, beep, 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 like a truck backing up. Beep, 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 and ends up in her lap. And I'm with his back to her. And I'm thinking, this is really sweet. It also makes a lot of sense to me. Because I only knew this mom for five minutes, and she was very intense. And this boy had been with her for seven years, his entire life. And so, um, this all made more sense. So she gives me this look that says, you see what I mean? So I, I meet with her privately. And she said, did you see what I mean? And I said, no, I didn't. And she said, so I asked her, what do you mean by connection? You said, he can't connect. What do you mean? And she said, you know, sit at the table and talk about our feelings and talk about our day. And I said, I'm really sorry. And you know the lottery? Like, you know, like not everybody wins the lottery. In fact, it's pretty rare to win the lottery. Like, there are a few seven-year-old boys in the world who really love to do that. And I'm really sorry you didn't get one. And she didn't think that was funny at all. And she went left to go find somebody who would fix her kid and make him able to connect the right way. So I wish I could have a happy ending to that story. But I guess the happy ending is I get to share this story with you to underline the point that our job as parents and teachers is to remember the importance of connection, but not to say what it's going to look like. Really, it's our children's job. They're going to say what it looks like. This is why when my daughter was little, I played a lot of games of Ariel the Little Mermaid, which was a horrible game. You know, you play Ariel the Little Mermaid in our house meant you take off their clothes of the dolls, and you put new clothes on, and you have a wedding. And it over and over again, it was terrible. But I played this game because I wanted to connect with her. Um, my ways of wanting to connect were not relevant to the, the relationship. I mean, over time, we have a lot of things now. She's a young adult, and there's a lot of things that we share, Other, not Ariel. <clears throat> um, so I was thinking about this when I started looking into this uh, latest research on children's brain development. because. 
it turns out that there are a few key things that children need for their brains to develop well. And the first and most fundamental one is they need to feel loved and they need to feel secure. They need to feel safe and they need a lot of affection. Now, we kind of all knew this. Who needed neuroscientists to prove this to us, right? But it's kind of, uh, it's kind of nice, I think, when the neuroscientists spend all this time and money and fancy equipment and they confirm the stuff that we knew or our grandmothers knew. Well, my grandmother didn't know that. But um, some of us had grandmothers who knew that children needed to be, you know, a lot of love and affection. Um, the, the next um, piece of brain research that really captured me that was more of a surprise to me um, has to do with the way that our, all the nerve cells in our brain, the neurons in our brain are organized. So we have trillions of nerve cells and it's way too many to just be randomly doing things so they're organized into different pathways. And what I mean by pathways is there's a pathway for uh, each sense, so sight and smell and taste and there's a pathway for each emotion. And there's a pathway for social engagement. And there's a pathway for logic and reason. You know, the, some of them are not very well developed for a long time, right? Um, there's a pathways for language. There's pathways um, for uh, fine motor movements and gross motor movements. And this research on brain development uh, is that children's brains develop best when multiple pathways in the brain are active at the same time. And this is really important for education because if you think about doing worksheets, for example, how much of your brain is engaged when you're doing a worksheet? Especially if you're required to sit still and not talk to anyone. It's a very, very thin sliver of your brain that is engaged at that, doing that. But you compare something like dramatic play. In dramatic play, the entire brain is active. You've got language, you've got emotion, you've got memory, you've got movement, you've got especially social engagement. And it turns out that of all these different pathways, the one that's most important to learning is the social engagement. And what's the number one rule in school? Be quiet. Be quiet. Don't talk to you. What do you get in, what's the number one thing you get in trouble for in school? Talking to the person next to you. Right? So there's a big problem here. And um, our schools have not caught up to this brain research, that children actually need to be socially engaged. This is why uh, we all learn better from a, a live teacher than from um, a video. And so certainly there's an incredible wealth of information and people are learning things by video, but there's no replacement for human to human uh, connection. Um, the next piece of research about education and learning is that we can't just pour information into children. We can't just pour knowledge into them like loading up a boxcar. Children need to absorb and integrate the knowledge that they receive. And how do you absorb and integrate knowledge? It's through rest, sleep, and play. So there's a lot of research that if you study something and you go right to the test, or you study something and you play and have a test, or study something and rest or sleep and have a test, you do better on the test if you played or if you slept in between. Even compared to if you did extra studying instead of doing those things. So um, again, our schools have not caught up with this. Um, rough housing is a particular kind of play that's especially important. Um, I'm a big fan of, of rough housing. One of my books, which is out there, you can take a look at is called The Art of Rough Housing, and I'm very much in favor of it. And good, healthy rough housing, whether it's between peers or a parent and a child, which is what uh, my book is focused on, the parent-child rough housing, it actually releases a chemical called brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which is like fertilizer for the brain. And so most of us think about rough housing as distraction, it's banned in school, um, a lot of us ban it at home, we think it's dangerous and we think it's a problem, but it's actually really, really not just healthy, but um, just even, in, even if all we cared about was test scores, then it would be better to do a lot of rough housing. Of course, we all care about more than test scores, right? Um, so um, what I'd like to do is, uh, since I'm talking about rough housing, I would like to not just talk about it, but 
Um, but how, well, we won't do a real pull pillow fight in here. But um, a lot of people are afraid of roughhousing because they think it means fighting. Okay, but there's a lot of kinds of what I call roughhousing that's more like dancing than like fighting. So if I can have a volunteer um, to show me, and then we'll all we'll all do it together. So I need a volunteer here. There's not going to be any uh, wrestling involved. Okay, sure, come on up. Thanks. <laughs> Oh, yeah, there it goes. So this is a little, this is different from um, pillow fighting or wrestling, which I'm also a big fan of. But this is called Force Field Hands. I, it just starts with Force Field Hands. I, I'm a big Star Trek fan. So if you put up your hands and they're almost touching my hands, mm -hmm. and do you feel anything? Not really. Okay. Sort of. Yeah. I'm starting to, yeah. Starting to feel what? Just like heat or warm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, warm or tingling is the, the biggest thing most people feel. Now what I want you to do is push my hands back using only that force between us. So no touching. Just right. <laughs> and did you feel it more or less? Uh, a little less as I... Okay, and I'm going to push you. <laughs> yeah, so it's, you know, it really, it's, okay, you know, it doesn't matter if you feel it or not. Um, so that's the first step, force field hands. And I, what I love about it is, like all good roughhousing, you have to tune into one another. And the essence, part of the essence of connection with parent and child is to tune into one another. When they're babies, we tune into their needs. You know how slowly you learn the difference between a hungry cry and a lonely cry and an angry cry? This is because we really tune into them. Um, and then we want children to tune into themselves and tune into other people. So children who are like, ah, and they run into people, this is a great game for them. So the next step, we touch hands, and we're going to gradually increase the pressure. So you start pushing more, but we're going to match each other's pressure exactly. OK, so this is called pushing hands. So we're both pushing very hard now. But nobody's going anywhere. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> Not yet. That's the next step. So this is a different type of tuning in. And if whenever, if you're doing any kind of roughhousing with your child, what you want to do is sort of match their resistance so that you don't overpower them. And I usually like to let them win at the end because it really helps build their confidence. And a lot of us are afraid, especially dads out there, uh, are often afraid to let children win. It's like, their peers are not going to let them win. It's like, right, they're not. So they need a little chance at home to build up some confidence. So then we add a little level of competition. Whoa. <laughs> You're better at this than I am. I've done it a lot. Glad I didn't go to the gym. <laughs> and so if, you know, if I was the, the parent in this situation, I would say, you'll never get me. You'll right. never push <laughs> me. <laughs> um, so thanks. Yeah, sure. yeah. So let's all stand up and try it and find a partner. If you're sitting by yourself, come up. If you need a partner, you can do it in threes, or you can come up and do it with me. So you start out almost touching. And then you push using just the force field between you. Does everybody have a part? Oh, here, come on down. Can you go with her? Push back and forth using just the force field. And then touch hands and gradually increase the pressure, but matching exactly the other person's pressure. And then do that for a minute, and then look. make sure you check behind you before you add a little competition. <laughs> <laughs> so 
Okay, thanks. <laughs> so um, this is one of my favorite games to teach children. Uh, so of course, some children will skip the not touching part and go straight to pushing as hard as they can, and that's fine. Um, I, I've known families who started doing this, and um, they, the, there was a mom who told me that she could then, she, she learned to tune in and catch her son who would get overwhelmed with frustration and have these big emotional meltdowns. But if she caught it early, she would say, let's push hands. And they'd push hands and she'd, she'd put, uh, and he'd, he'd have to use all of his strength to push her all around the house and up and down the halls. And then they'd, she'd end up falling down on her bed and he'd jump on top of her and they would have a big cuddle which was kind of remarkable. These things never ended in cuddles before. These always ended in miserable mess. And then he got to the point where he would start to initiate it. He would say, could we do pushing hands? Because he started to tune into himself and really recognize that he needed that. And this, I think, is, is this power of play and the power of connection combined. Um, <clears throat> We often, as adults, we've forgotten how to play. We've forgotten that it's important to play. And people ask me all the time, well, I'm not playful. I'm not playful. I don't know what games to play. And it doesn't matter because you have living with you in your home an expert on play, or more than one. And our children play as the universal language of childhood. And unless a child has been really severely traumatized, they really know how to play. And if they have been traumatized, then play is the road out, we just have to be very slow and gentle and let them be completely in charge of the play. Um, and in fact, even if children have not been traumatized, it's great that they ha if they have some time each week where they can be completely in charge of their play with you. So I'm a big fan of uh, what I call special time, which is a half an hour, an hour, once or twice a week, where it's one-on-one, -on -one, Undivided attention, that means put away your phone. We, you know, I, you've heard this before, but we're, we, we are so upset about our children on their phones, but guess what, right? We're the ones who need to put our phones down. So we put our phones down, we're not working on dinner, not doing work. Um, if you have a big family, you somehow figure out how each one can get some time with you alone. Um, and what you say is, I'm here, I've got an hour for you, it's our special time, whatever you'd like to do. And some people will say, well, I know what you'd like to do, and, but don't, you might not. So just let them, they're completely in charge, as long as it's not too expensive or dangerous, right? So, um, and if they're like, I don't know what to do, what should we do? Don't rescue them from that. Just smile and say, oh, I'm sure that you'll figure out what to do. I'm right here. And uh, for me doing this, what was really important was having a little extra enthusiasm. Because I, you know, I, as a, as a parent of a young child, I was just tired all the time, and um, I was like, oh, okay, fine, I'll play. But um, when I set the timer, and at first I could only do it for 10 minutes, and I'd set the timer for 10 minutes, and I'd say, hey, you want to play Ariel the Little Mermaid? Um, so that was not special time, because that was me deciding what to play, but that was me kind of pushing myself to not, uh, to be enthusiastic. And I did that to kind of practice enthusiasm um, and then later I could say, oh, it's special time, and I could be really enthusiastic for that hour. And then really glad the hour's up. Now, a lot of times children will, will have a fit when the time's over. And then we won't want to do it again, because it's so annoying to fight with them. And my answer to that is, if they want to have a fit at the end of the time, then what you do is that you set aside an hour, and after a half an hour, you tell them, time's up. And then if they want to spend the next half hour arguing and complaining and you never play with me and you never play with me and you're so mean, then that's just how they've decided to spend the second half of their hour. And you can just enjoy it. Um, because sometimes children just want to, want to do that and we hate it. But if you've already budgeted it in your time, then you can just accept it and roll with it. Um, so what does this have to do with learning? Um, I think that there's a funny thing that happened, I don't know how long ago, um, where parents got this idea, they heard, uh, learned that children learn through play, which is true. But some parents took this the wrong way 
And they took this to mean that I have to be teaching my child whenever we're playing. And so I see parents at the park, and the child's playing with a truck, and the parent is saying, how many wheels does the truck have? What color is the truck? What color is this truck? And the poor child just wants to play with the truck. And they need to just play with the truck. And if they get to just play with the truck the way children have been playing with trucks forever, they will learn about, uh, they will learn about colors, and they will learn about numbers, and they will learn about physics, and they'll learn about force, and they'll learn about um, their bodies, and their, all these things much deeper than if we're always trying to teach them something. Um, so here's an example of this. Um, uh, over 100 years ago, the Swiss psychologist Jean Piaget, you may have heard of Piaget, um, he discovered that, that young children, if you have a tall skinny cup and a short fat cup, and they're filled with water, and you ask a young child, which has more water, they'll point to the tall one. Okay? And at a certain age, I never remember the ages for these things. You probably know which, what these ages are supposed to be. Um, they, they get it. And they can say, oh, they have the same amount of water. Okay? Now, the funny thing is, you can lecture children for hours and hours and hours, and it will not help them get this at all. It cannot be taught. Children will naturally develop the ability to, to understand this about volume by playing with water, by pouring water back and forth in the bathtub or in the sink, or sand, or this is how they learn this. The lecture just actually, it doesn't work, and it's just annoying. Um, and uh, it's the, actually the play that works. And so the, a lot of parents nowadays will say, yeah, play is great, play is great. Children learn through play. But if it comes down to it, really, learning is a different thing, and it's more important. So um, I heard this so many times that I came up with this phrase, um, called, which I call deep learning. And I always say it like, deep learning. And uh, it's like, deep learning is what will get your children into Ivy League colleges. And deep learning is what has them really have a deep understanding of the universe. And well, what's deep learning? It really is play. It's, um, it's discovering the, the world. This is what children need to do. And I'm not just talking about preschoolers. Okay? Um, this is true really all through. And I would argue that it's true for us as adults, that um, the, our, the great discoveries, creative advances, uh, flashes of insight, the most exciting parts of our work, no matter what that work is, um, is, happens in a state that's very similar to play. It's this uh, sometimes called the flow state when we're talking about adults, but it's so similar to play. Time kind of disappears. We're not worried about the outcome. We're really focused in the moment. Um, we're really engrossed. Um, there's a joy, but it's this sort of quiet um, joy sometimes. So, um, so this is not just for young children. Um, <clears throat> let's see, what else do I want to say? Um, a lot of parents are afraid of risk. A lot of schools are, I mean, afraid of play. A lot of schools are afraid of play because of risk. And I want to make a big plug for the value of risk, that children need to take risks. Um, I have a friend and her brother, when he had kids, uh, taped every corner of everything in the house and uh, left the tape on there until the kids were 18. Okay, so this is an extreme. Um, no matter how extreme we are, there's always somebody at further extreme of being afraid of risk. But I think most of us need to push ourselves a little bit. I've only met a few people who I've said, you actually need to rein it in a little bit and be more careful. Almost everybody I meet uh, really needs to loosen up a little bit and allow a little bit of risk. You know, for me, this moment came when my daughter was about three or four, and she was climbing on this climbing structure. And I was down below saying, be careful, be careful, be careful. And um, my wife came over, and she said, you know, Larry, uh, she's going to recover better from a broken arm or a broken leg than from being timid and fearful her whole life. And she very kindly and wisely didn't say, like you, Larry, um, which was, would have been true, but it was would have made it harder for me to take in and absorb this. And so I really 
connected the dots and was like, yeah, you know what? I never climbed trees and I was scared of everything and, and uh, I never broke my arm. But um, I kind of wish that I had done riskier things and not have to have do so much work as an adult to overcome anxiety. So I really took that to heart. Um, and my daughter, when she turned 25, she climbed Mount Kilimanjaro and she went like, there's a hard way and a harder way and she went like the harder way. And um, so I said to her, you know, I really, I'm sorry you had to deal with having an anxious dad. She said, oh, I don't think you were an anxious dad. I was like, yeah, oh, yeah. Um, so I was really pleased that I had taken that to heart and let her take risks. Um, I, not that I wasn't overprotective in my own way at times. Um, I just, um, I just visited, I, I wish I had uh, thought to bring a video. I just visited these schools in China um, in this, this area called Anji, A-N-J-I. If you look up Anji Play, A-N-J-I Play, uh, I think it's anjiplay.com, they really, it's this play-based um, uh, schools for ages three through six, which is what they call kindergarten in China. Um, it's everything before primary school. And risk is one of the key values. Love, risk, joy, engagement. These are the values. And so these children climb ladders and they climb trees and they build fires and cook their own lunch and they have these 50 gallon oil drums and they start by getting in, well there's some, they're plastic now that are that same shape as a 50 gallon oil drum and they get inside and lean on them and then they lean it against a wall and climb on it and then it's only, they don't have to but if they want to then they start walking on them. I tried this, it's really hard. Um, but I saw these three and four year olds and they're like duh, duh, duh. some of them are dancing on it because they keep, when you can own your own risk and you're in charge of your own play and you're really as self-directed then uh, it's much less dangerous. They actually have fewer injuries than the average um, school that's not doing this risky play because the children are in charge of their environment. Um, and it's really exciting to see. Um, let's see. Um, how many of you have homework struggles at home? So a few of you. The rest of you have younger children or no homework? Excellent. Um, that's the best solution to homework struggle that I've heard that I know. That's my favorite. But, um, but let me give you some examples anyway for homework struggle. And, and really, they can be adapted to, um, to any kind of family struggle. Okay? So, um, in fact, this first one I developed when my daughter had to take the violin. In, in Brookline Public Schools, in fourth grade, you have to take the violin. And, um, my daughter was not destined to be a violinist. And so it was, and she didn't like it. And so it was kind of torture for both of us. I was in charge of making sure she practiced every day. And so we, it took us a long time, but I figured out to take frustration breaks. And so I, this is something that I highly recommend. So, because it was really frustrating and the frustrating builds and builds. So instead we took frustration breaks. So frustration break, meant that a few minutes in, I would say, oh, time for a frustration break. And the first time, she, we were like, well, what should we do? What would, what would ease that frustration? And her idea was take the violin and smash it on the ground. I said, oh, let's think of some alternatives. So what we came up with was she would crumple a piece of paper and throw it at the wall. And then I would make noises like a crashing violin. And this was very satisfying. Not as satisfying probably as for her as if she'd smashed the violin, but it was good enough. And it broke the frustration. It did not make her a better violinist. Okay? Um, it, if she was destined to be a violinist, it would have really helped because it made the, the practices much more tolerable, much less frustrating for both of us. In fact, we enjoyed them. Um, but. Um, she, she was able to apply this actually in other areas of life that actually um, she did excel at. Right? Now children, of course, they don't, uh, often they don't have as much frustration if they're really excelling at something. Um, uh, unless they're really pushing and pushing and pushing themselves. So there's always going to be some frustration. Um, another thing I recommend for whether it's homework struggle or, um, 
or music practice struggle or um, really anything is pillow fighting. So 10 minutes of pillow, pillow fighting um, before homework, before violin practice. Um, and um, some, some people can pillow fight before bed. Um, some kids are like, that's a disaster. Um, you want to have at least an hour after you're done. Um, and, um, and some kids need, if you're going to start pillow fighting, they can't do 10 minutes. It really needs to have a whole 30 minutes or an hour. Um, otherwise, you tell them to stop, or it's time to stop, and they just, it just it gets them all agitated. So you have to know your own kid that way. Um, but it really makes a big difference. Um, another one of my favorite play things for frustrations in children is based on the, the pun in English on the word tackle. So we tackle a problem and you tackle a person. So um, the problem could be um, a homework problem, or it could be a mean friend, or it could be um, a worry. And you say, I'll be the problem, I'll be the math problem, I'll be the mean friend, I'll be the worry, and you have to tackle me, because you have to tackle that problem. And then it's just like the pushing hands. You put up a lot of resistance, but eventually they get you to the ground, and they do this uh, victory dance, and they feel this big sense of accomplishment. Um, and it's a great symbolic and playful way for them to overcome something that's been a big obstacle. Um, something similar to this is what I call bring a problem into the play zone. So um, this is great for what I call uh, a knot of tension. And a knot of tension in a family is something that happens repeatedly that there's a lot of tension about. And the more you argue over it and fight over it, it, it the knot gets tighter and tighter and tighter. So it could be brushing teeth or meal times, or bedtimes, or homework, or taking medicine. And these are all things that we care about. And so we put a lot of tension in it. And what happens when you and your child get into a knot of tension is they dig in their heels, and then we get more and more frustrated. I find whenever I'm in a knot of tension, I lose IQ points. And so I remember when my daughter started kindergarten, and she suddenly said, I can't get dressed by myself. You have to help me. And I thought, this is really weird, because she's been getting dressed by herself for years. And I hoped her teachers knew that she was choosing her own outfits, right? And so, um, but suddenly she said, I can't get dressed by myself. And, I'd, and I tried to argue with her, right? I'm sure you've tried to reason with your child. So, you know, nothing wrong with logic and reason, except that has anybody had that be successful? <laughs> so I can prove. Um, I can't prove that she can get dressed by herself, but she can very easily prove that she can. I mean, that she can't. Sorry. So even though logic and reason and evidence is on my side, it doesn't matter. She would win those arguments. And so I would go to help her, but I'd go to help her with a lot of frustration. So I'd say, OK, fine, I'll help you. And she'd be like, no, I'm going away, I'm going away. Sorry. And um, so then it's like, OK, fine, I'll leave. No, you have to help me. OK, fine, I'll help you. No. And so this was terrible. And the loss of IQ points was I had no idea what was going on. Here, I'm a child psychologist, but I did not know what was going on. I, this was a big mystery. I thought there's something defective about my child. Uh, I, you know, I didn't want to blame myself, but I kind of secretly did. And so I worked out this thing where I would like pretend to help her. And it was really annoying. And I'm thinking this is going to go on forever. And finally, uh, not out of any insight, but just out of boredom one day, I picked up um, two uh, stuffed animals on her bed. I would sit on her bed usually when we were doing this. And um, it would go on forever. But I picked up two stuffed animals, and I had one of them say, she can't get dressed by herself. She's only five years old. And the other one said, oh, yes, she can. She's the amazing Emma. And it was like, oh, no, she can't. She doesn't even know her pants from her elbows. And she's laughing at this and putting on her clothes. And I wasn't even expecting that to happen. This was a bonus. I was just entertaining myself because I was bored. And she says, look, look, look. And this is like, oh, your dad helped you. And that was funny because I said it. And I was on the other side of the room. And, and it was like, oh, you're ridiculous. And they start fighting. And she's laughing. And I'm laughing. And she's dressed. And she's marching out of the house, out of the room, really happy. And she says, can we play this game again tomorrow? And I'm like, oh, God, i got to play this game the next 13 years. So, 
But we actually just played it a few more times. And she got unstuck and started dressing herself happily. I got my IQ points back because the knot of tension was gone. I was like, oh, I think I know what's going on. She's in kindergarten now. She, you know, the teachers, you know, scold the, the students. And I mean, there's a, the teacher was in her last year before retirement and she was a little tired and she was, you know, we'd get frustrated and, and my daughter would never be the one to get in trouble, but it was really upsetting to her that other children were getting in trouble and they would lose recess. This was like the beginning of core curriculum stuff 20 something years ago. And it's like, well, we didn't have recess because we were behind in the curriculum. I was like, oh God, this is crazy. And um, so what I realized is she's thinking, we have to be on time and it's so strict and all these things and I'm not ready. It's like, what's next? I'm gonna have to get a job and an apartment and I'm not ready. And what is it? So of course she's five, she can't say all that. So what she says is, I can't get dressed by myself. This is the closest she can come to saying, I'm not ready to be big and grown up, even though part of me wants to. And so once I understood that, then I could talk to her about, oh yeah, you're still like a little girl, and, and we could just sort of feed that and play baby and, and feed that need to still be little, and then she could be the one to say, no, I want to be big. Um, so since then, even though I stumbled on this, I, now I use this all the time for, for all kinds of problems. So I call it bringing a problem into the play zone. Because in the serious zone, the problem just gets bigger and uglier. But in the play zone, we can really do something. Um, something different happens, something creative happens. Um, so play goes out the window when we're stressed. Um, is there anybody here who's playful about setting limits with your children? Is it, that's nuts, right? How can you be playful about setting limits? So I think what happened is most of us grew up with what I call the package deal. And the package deal was on one package was no, and that's it. And the no was harsh, and it was cold, and I don't want to hear anything about it. And the other package was, yeah, fine, I don't care. Right? Is that familiar? And so we haven't really learned, we haven't had practice saying no in a really relaxed way. Or, oh, no, you don't, Buster. That's not going to happen today. Or, what do you mean you're not cleaning up? We're going to clean up right now. And just having a really lighthearted tone of voice when we're actually holding that limit. Because a lot of us, we don't want to be harsh and mean and nasty, and so we end up not setting limits enough. And that becomes a big problem. And then we explode because we can't do that. And then we get the worst of both worlds. It's like no limits and then uh, yelling and, and, and nasty. Um, so there's a book, some of you probably know this book called uh, Don't Let the Pigeon Drive the Bus. So children love this book. There's, in the story, of the don't, if you don't know it, the, the bus driver says to the reader, um, hey, could you watch my bus a while? I got to go somewhere. And whatever you do, don't let the pigeon drive the bus. And you're thinking, this is kind of weird. And then the pigeon shows up and says, hey, could I drive the bus? And p kids love it because they get to say no to the pigeon, right? But I love it. I use it with parents because um, you, know, you just can stay relaxed, right? Because who's going to say yes to the pigeon right, driving the bus? But you don't actually need to get mad. So we can practice it, you know? So um, please, 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 can I drive the bus? I'll be your best friend. My cousin Harvey gets to drive a bus, really. I'm, uh, you better let me, I'm gonna hold my breath so I turn blue. <laughs> oh. So was anybody tempted to say yes? Okay, sometimes people are. Is anybody tempted to say shut up, I don't wanna hear it anymore? <laughs> yeah. So, um, it's the, the, the main point I want to make is that it's possible to be playful even when we need to say no. Not always, of course. Sometimes we're serious. Um, but we don't have to be dead serious. If we terrify our children or we shame our children um, or we withhold love for them, they don't actually learn anything useful. They, 
become uh, overwhelmed with fear or shame. And this is not the, the most powerful way to learn. Of course, they will learn something out of fear, but it's not the deepest kind of learning when you're doing it based on fear. Um, so um, let's see. Let me um, share one more thing, and then I'm going to um, turn it over. Um, so let me just get a sense of your, your kids. So children under five, okay, uh, five to 10, okay, a lot of those, 11 to 15, great. Okay, so the biggest group was this five to 10, right? So, um, so let me say a little bit about worries, because I think this is a year, this is an age range, and it's certainly relevant for younger and older, and I certainly deal with it myself as an adult. Um, but, um, but it's kind of a prime time for worries and fears. Because the world is kind of bigger, and they're aware of the world, and they learn about tornadoes and hurricanes, and, um, and they hear bad things on the news and stuff like this. And so um, they can have a lot of worries and fears. And, of course, we reassure them as best we can, um, but I want to talk about just some playful approaches to worries and fears. So um, one of them is, um, well, I already talked about tackling the problem, but any kind of roughhousing gives children a sense of confidence. Um, I think that th there's another one, which is if a child's afraid of dogs, um, or anything concrete in the world, afraid of the swimming pool or um, something like that, you just go uh, hand in hand with them or side by side with them and say, we're going to go find a dog and um, we're going to go as slow or as fast as you want and let's take one little step. And you've got a relaxed attitude and you've got this attitude that we have all the time in the world. This is part of what makes it up uh, in the territory of play got all the time in the world. You might not get to the dog. You might just get a couple of feet. And they go, ah, okay, let's take a step back. And it's like, oh, phew. Let's call. Okay, you ready to take a step? Okay. And you go really, really slowly, one little step at a time. And it's kind of magical. And you might not get there after 10 or 15 minutes. It's like, oh, let's, let's do some more tomorrow. The idea is Children with anxieties and worries and fears kind of live in the all or nothing. So if you think about one through 10, and 10 is Wah! and one is ah, everything's fine, um, a lot of anxious children live at one or 10. And if you say, we don't have to go swimming, I know it upsets you, then ah, oh, we're going home, I'm back at one. That's great. No, we're going, I don't want to hear anything about it, we're going ah, and then they're at 10. And so they don't have that experience of being in between. And so the, oh, let's take a little baby step towards the pool. The idea is to be at four or five. And you do the same thing by um, activities like, let's draw a picture of your nightmare, or let's draw a picture of, um, of the worry. Um, and then what do you want to do with the picture? And when I first started doing this, I assumed that children would want to tear it up or burn it. But a lot of kids want to draw the picture of it and put it on their wall. It's like, why would you want to look at the picture of your nightmare? Well, it's because they transformed it through art and symbolic activity. They transformed it into something that they can control, that's manageable. So, um, and then they want, to, they want to look at it. They want it up there. Um, another play technique that's great for this age is um, they're worried about something, is to give them an imaginary remote control. And so, because they, they, they tell you stories all the time or they're worried about something that might happen, they're upset about something that did happen, and you say, okay, here's your remote control. You can speed up over that section. You can skip a section. You can slow a section down. You can rewind. You can make the picture look like it's really tiny, really far away. And these are symbolic activities that actually change the way children experience their fear in their brain. Um, so um, I'm going to stop there and turn it over to uh, Mrs. Gleason, um, who's going to talk about play in school, right? So, and then we're all going to do some Q&A after.
Good evening, everybody. It's nice to see you. Um, I have the opportunity to give the academic or the, the school-based um, focus on play, um, and which directly complements Dr. Cohen's um, and echoes his work this evening. Um, so uh, uh, Mrs. Doreen Parker and I work very closely together um, and also in partnership with other kindergarten teachers um, to embed play in what we do um, every day at um, Placentino School in particular. Um, but this evening I'll have the opportunity to really share with you um, exactly what's happening in kindergarten. Um, so it's not just secular to kindergarten necessarily. Kindergarten is a really neat place. We have a whole bunch of ecocentric bodies that are moving around the building, um, thinking about themselves the entire time, um, and we have the opportunity to cultivate that. Um, and so while they're working um, individually, um, we as teachers, um, I was a kindergarten teacher for seven years um, and had the also the opportunity to be a second grade teacher at one point. Um, and I also have two littles at home. I have a two-year-old son and a four-year-old daughter. Um, so play is a big part of my world. But um, kindergarten in particular is this really neat niche um, and provides us the opportunity to, um, to allow kids to experience life. Um, with hands-on um, movements. So um, as much as literacy and standards are all very important, um, we think creativity is our main point. Um, and standards actually lead this focus. So um, what I mean by that is so Massachusetts created um, a bank of sta uh, standards in a, whole, in a few different uh, subject matter, in particular math and English language arts. And so what um, we did this summer, uh, of uh, this past summer in August, is we spent time together unpacking those standards. And the beauty of the new standards here in Massachusetts are that um, there's lots of language around demonstrating, constructing, experimenting, modeling, mastering. Um, those are all um, threads of uh, words that happen throughout the course of the standards. And what um, we as a kindergarten team worked on this summer was f utilizing those standards in relation to play. So we took the play, the experiences we know our kids like to do, and then we backed in the standards into those um, pieces. Um, and it's just a nice way to use the system to make sense of what kids are really working on in the classroom. Um, but ultimately, cl um, play fosters the connections between peers. It builds self-confidence. Um, it allows for um, children to enable themselves and learn to negotiate complex rules and work together. Um, and ultimately, what we're doing is we're cultivating an inherent worth. So the more opportunities children get to spend with each other, experiencing each other, playing with each other, disagreeing with each other, having a discord in whatever faction, they become more powerful within their own universe. And so we, our job as teachers is to create an environment within the classroom that gives them those types of opportunities. And so there's a ceiling to that in some capacity. I mean, we're, we're a school, we're an institution, which is an awful word, but true. Um, so how do we do that? What's the best way to put the, the tires on the road and make sense of that for little ones? So um, we have taken this work and use what um, is called the constructivist model. So there's a whole bunch of different developmental models of understanding about human brain development and understanding how children interact with the world. And so the constructivist model, it's nothing new. So 1916, a gentleman named John Dewey came forward with the understanding that interacting with one's environment, i.e. constructivism, bumping into things, making a mess of it, putting it all back together, and potentially making a mess of it again was good. And so kids really exemplified that. So all this, while we're talking about it now, and seemingly could be potentially current to today's date, is actually quite old. Um, which is kind of exciting, gives us a whole bunch of research. So Dr. Kahn talked a lot about that research here, so I'm going to give um, some highlights in what, actually what's going on in the classrooms. Um, so our classrooms are modular. Um, this classroom on the left-hand side, it's actually um, Mrs. Nenlock's classroom. And it also is exemplified in Mrs. Parker's room, um, and also Ms. Hart's room, and various other classrooms around the schoolhouse to be perfectly honest, but in particular in kindergarten. So the difference that we're seeing here in this classroom is that children have modular seating. They're sitting on the floor, they're sitting on cushions, they're sitting on something called a sit and move. It's actually a halfway inflated disc, um, bumpy on one side, smooth on the other. Um, some children are sitting on their, it's a stool, but it can roll and move. And so kids are sitting in small groups. It's interactive just sheer by the hardscape environment. But um, the seating allows kids to move on their own, um, reach over the table, make it very natural to engage with each other. 
Um, and the learning really is happening based off what the children's interest is. And I'll talk about teachers as, facil as facilitators in addition in just a moment. But what we like to do at Placentino in particular is think of children um, not only as receivers of information, but shapers of knowledge. So how do we do that? Um, so what we did this summer in particular is we unpacked a whole bunch of information around um, Selma Wasserman's work. And um, she wrote a book, 1996, that has been reinvented since, but I like the 1996 version. And what it talks really about is about play, debrief, replay. So allowing children to go into the environment and play. And then the teacher comes in and talks about the good play that's happening, i.e., tell me about your work. I noticed that you're working with a truck. Wow, that truck is really loud. Tell me more about that. Oh, your friend wants to come over and join you. Those open-ended, um, scaffolded questions allow teachers to learn from the child what's important for them at that time, at that play experience, and then pose a question, which is, I want to help you. Let me bring over some blocks. I'm going to start a road here. And then she backs away. So that's project-based learning, which is a nuance to our um, new learning environment. But it's been around for a long time. And ultimately, what it is is you pose a challenge or a change to the learning environment. You, you ask the children to almost raise the bar for themselves. And then you back away. And you offer materials, and you give scaffolding, and you care about them the entire time. You're always there. You're going to give them what they need. They know they can ask you questions. They can always go to the bathroom, those kinds of things. But all the while, they're gearing the play. Okay? They don't know how long they're playing for, which is really nice. Our, our kindergartens, in particular, are playing up to 90 minutes in the afternoon every single day. And it's scaffolded learning. And it's learning where the teachers are sitting on the floor with kids talking about the play talking about the materials. Um, I'll get to my next slide, which will exemplify that in a little bit. We also have another opportunity that's happening at Placentino and potentially at Miller um, soon is what's called a maker space. There's all these words that mean virtually the same thing. But maker space is a place um, that was, uh, is, is now existing in our current library at Placentino School. And Mrs. Winnie Carey is really leading the charge there. And ultimately, what she's doing is she's creating um, small groups, of, uh, small uh, sections in that space. I think some of you have actually volunteered in there, which is really great. Um, and she poses um, a challenge. She reads a story. And uh, one that comes to mind is Peppy, who's our um, mascot, um, the penguin. I actually dressed up as Peppy today, which was really invigorating for the care party. Um, <laughs> Um, but, you know, uh, jack of all trades, right? Um, but uh, it was fun. And so um, Pepe uh, had a problem. He needed something to, um, to fish with. He had, I think he lost some modality of getting fish. So the children had to build him something. So they, he, she put a whole bunch of mater uh, recycled materials on the table of various sizes, shapes, and colors, and tape, and all this business. And the children worked together to fix Peppy's problem. And so they built this really wonderful structure that was all based in them. And they had a whole explanation as to why um, they were building it in such a way. And Mrs. Carey's objective was really just to keep the momentum of the conversation and the building going, um, providing at one point pipe cleaners where there hadn't been pipe cleaners on the table. She changed the learning, PBL. And so this is the thing where they're talking about tinkering and all those pieces. That's exactly what it is. But the kids are designing it on, on, it's like on the fly, which is really exciting. And then at the end, they, have to sh they share. Tell me about what you built for Peppy. How is it going to work for her or him? Depends on which child you talk to, because he's quite ambiguous. Um, but, um, and the kids loved it. They stood up, five-year-olds, they stood up. They told their story, they held their material, and they told, them, they told us about what they were working on. Um, and this is a really wonderful opportunity for us. Um, it gives us a chance to really know the inner workings and interests of kids, but as teachers, have the opportunity to really engage with them firsthand. And you know, um, Dr. Cohn was talking earlier about you know, that core-based instruction. And that is a place. I mean, we're in a systems environment. Education, unfortunately, is what it is currently. But we can provide a sense of evolution to it. And so we can still embrace the core instruction and the standards and all those pieces. But if we change the learning environment to meet the needs of kids in real time and make it malleable and provide the time and space in which the kids can interact with themselves, each other, 
and then exemplify their understandings and potentially, potentially a product, most importantly the process of the learning or the process of doing, then we get children who feel really good about themselves and then they'll know themselves no matter what struggle or challenge comes about because they will have already gone through those pathways in their own mind and thought about how they then will either interact with someone else, be the leader, take it over, and facilitate potentially somebody else. So we're building that. Um, and we're building our community that way here in Holliston, which is really nice. So how our teachers are facilitators. This is um, Ms. Jill Hart. She's one of our kindergarten teachers. And so um, I was um, in her classroom observing, just taking a peek at some play that was happening. It was just at the beginning of the play, actually. And um, these three children were um, in, the in the meeting area section of the classroom. And they only had, about, only had about five blocks. And most of them were square. Um, one of them was a long rectangle. And so um, they're triplets. They're darling. And they really have, they function in different capacities with each other. It's fascinating to watch. But anyway, um, so teacher, T, says, what do you think we can do with these blocks? Student says, I think we can build a tunnel to fit a bear. Teacher says, you could use an archway. She inputs vocabulary. Archway is part of what their math work and vision is working on. There's the system, but she's using it in a play-based environment. So she's imposed a vocabulary word. Now she's going to exemplify it in learning. Um, now you can use an archway. Could you build one big enough for a bear? Child takes over and says, we need a small enough bear. So you're not going to tell me how to build this. I'm doing it myself. She goes and gets some material, some bears for them, and they continue forward. All she did was provide momentum, materials, and then she shifted a smidge to add academic vocabulary. So it all can be done. It takes more time, honestly. As a teacher, it takes more time. I mean, ultimately, what you could do with something like this, if it were, so we're in December, if we were in March or April or May, the end result could potentially be a piece of paper with an open space on the top and some lines on the bottom. And if the children felt appropriate, they could then exemplify their work in the block area by drawing a picture, labeling it, and then telling a story, a narrative story about themselves interacting with the play. So there's all kinds of different options to integrate writing and reading and, and um, children sharing with each other about their work. Um, and so those are kinds of ways that we can continue to propel the learning forward. So play is an investment that we have in Holliston. Dr. Jackson led us off with the right foot this school year. He gave us um, kind of free, freelance work uh, to kind of um, move forward. And I have to tell you, as an educator, as an early childhood person, and as a constructivist, when I heard him speak this way at the beginning of the school year, it really felt good. It felt like we were in the right spot. And that's what kind of started our curriculum work writing um, this summer. And, you know, curriculum work is something that's slow going. It's time, it's space together, me and the teachers spending time with each other, learning from each other what's important. And then ultimately, by the end of the year, we will have a formalized written curriculum that someone then could replicate. Um, so we partner with our teachers to do just what I had just mentioned. Professional development is provided, um, and it's research-based. So previously to this school year, we had a, um, a uh, we network out with universities and, and colleges. Um, a very wonderful um, Dr. Uh, Villegas uh, Ramers from Wheelock College had come out. She's one of my professors from when I was in graduate school. And she'd come out to really talk about the developmental process in relation to the student learning environment. Um, so she gave us those, uh, those underpinnings set the soil just right for this school year. Um, and we're going to continue that professional development together, um, working in real time around what we can do for children to give them the best learning environment. Um, we're, refining, we're refining the educational view. We're really taking a look um, as children, as collaborators, um, working together um, and having those constructive acti activities that give them the most out of their learning environment. Um, and then also having teachers observe each other, spend time with each other in each other's classrooms, talk, spend time together, unpack it. What's working, what's not working, how do we make revisions, how do we make it better? Um, all those professional development pieces. Um, professional development isn't always about a stand and deliver, someone always giving to somebody else. Sometimes it's just about sitting with each other, um, hearing about what happened the day before and then where we can go next. And then we've partnered with um, our, our PTO here in Holliston, and they are so gracious um, with helping us along our way. So um, they actually um, 
they're not cheap. They're, <laughs> they purchased us these really fabulous lakeshore multicultural people for our block area. Um, we have to get more, brace yourself. Um, but they're really cool, and they give us an opportunity to replicate the, the families that live here in Holliston and give us an opportunity to provide more for our kids. So that there's lots and lots more um, to come. But, and this is just a glimpse into some of the things that are pretty exciting and um, that are happening within our classrooms. But um, early childhood is, is our heart, and um, it's pretty much the foundation for everything we do. So thank you. Um, what we're going to do now is we'll just take a moment to allow our speakers to take a seat up on the, on the stage so that you can see them easily. And then I'll help um, project any questions that you may have. Is there anybody that wants to start off with a question for one of our panelists here? Thank you. Thank you. I just had a specific question about the kind of like last <laughs> um, I had a, Dr. Cohen, you ended with um, a really neat thing that I just wanted to hear a little bit more about using that remote control um, to target certain worries or fears. Um, could you explain that a little bit more? It, I love the tackle the problem, and, I'll, and I was trying to figure out in terms of um, just how, play that out a little bit more. Sure. I think that the remote control device is something that our children all know right. about um, and understand how it works. And so the idea is taking something that feels too big, okay, because the problems our children face feel too big for them. It's, they, they have a big emotion about it. They can't handle it. And... Um, it's it's a symbol. It, it brings it into the symbolic world. Um, it puts a symbolic container around it. I guess I'm kind of mixing my metaphors here, but um, and it allows them to use this concept that they know to take something too big to handle and and make it manageable. And so, so the conversation. Yeah. So it's like, oh yeah, you know what I. You can you can just introduce them to you know like a, what a remote control does. Here's a magical remote control, and you can use it to like these these thoughts that go through your head, and so like oh the teacher doesn't like me or something like that. And mm -hmm. it's like oh well let's take the story of what happened. Now let's slow it down. Okay, can we watch it frame by frame? Or maybe it's like no 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 I don't want that. Okay, let's zip let's zip through it. Okay. And you're looking for it's a balance between soothing and calming, but also dealing with it and approaching it. Okay. And so slow it down is the let's deal with it and approach it, mm -hmm. zip through it. It's like, oh, let's just skip that part for now. We always have to balance those parts. So it's just, it's um, the same way children will naturally bring things into play. So children in the block corner um, or the doll corner or you know, they'll, they'll play house, they'll play little siblings, you know, like, act out. you know when somebody in the classroom has had a little sibling, right? Because it just sweeps through the, everybody is dealing with now with, right. with family stuff. And they'll just naturally do that. So this just adds a little tool for them to do that. Okay, I get it, Mark. Thank you. Another question? I've got a question actually for Mrs. Parker. Um, I'd like to know some more about how the children are responding to the um, play-based learning that's going on within the classrooms. Um, well, this is something we've started formally this year, as Susan was saying, we met uh, in, in the traditional classrooms. First of all, I see a few parents there. If you came into my room, you wouldn't recognize it. We've lowered our tables. I think I have five chairs in my room now. A lot of cushions, a lot of wobbly stools, a lot of other, um, so it looks very different. But the way I've designed it this year and what we do is we're currently, we take our Reading Street program, we're using that essential question to help guide our play in the afternoon. So um, it may be how do children get to school? And then we take four or five different learning stations, dramatic play, um, a construction area, um, an art area, um, there may be a fine motor, and we let the students then, um, we talk about that question, 
then we set out different materials, and then we let them select where they want to go. And they kind of, after we've introduced the areas, they kind of take over within, and we'll go over and say, well, what do you think? I had one for that, for one of those examples. Um, I had children in the block areas, and they, <laughs> they built a yacht. Um, and I was like, oh, okay, what's this? Tell me about it. And we had all the little people there, and they said, well, they're going to school. And I said, well, yes, they may be. Um, so we, and then we would go to different places, um, uh, at different parts of the room, and it's, it's, they love it. We love it. I was saying to uh, Mrs. Gleason, I now am more interacting with my students. Um, when we had play previously, they would go play, and we might be, you know, grading papers or doing something different. I mean, now we're really with them. Um, I had a group of kids yesterday who we were doing a, a, working with a bear theme right now, and so we had out Lincoln Logs, and they took our, we had little bear manipulatives that they wanted in the bear area, because even though it was Lincoln Logs, they wanted the bears there, so we brought those over. <laughs> And they built the house around them, and they put them in, but they, the bears couldn't see. So I was like, well, what do you think we can do? And they just were fascinated with they wanted to build, build windows and take this apart and make it work. Well, they did it. So they are loving it. Um, I'm loving it. Uh, we, we, in my classroom, we do it four days a week on the, other, on the other, and it's in the afternoon on that fourth day we do an open circle. So, I mean, that's how I, but um, then what I do after that is we come back and we talk about some of the neat things we saw. Um, those centers repeat for the week. Um, and then if we need to continue them on, we do or we alter it. But it always has that, that theme base. Um, and the children get to, I have, as I said, those five areas, um, they get to change or select or go to different places and they take their name it's there's this big chart and they they do what they want um, the other thing that I found too they're they're pretty smart um, I let them choose their tables each day and they get to select um, I alter my table colors it's kind of confusing but each day I'll go okay the orange table gets to pick their center in the afternoon first or the and I move I have these little clips that I move along um, so they go behind and they try to figure out because they want to be able to pick their center first. So they, they've figured out my system, so I might have to change that up. But, <laughs> um, but they are loving it, and we are too. We really have embraced it, and we're pretty excited about it. We met today. A group of us met during our planning time um, just to check in. Um, we're, we're continuing with our um, planning, our curriculum, um, so it's evolving. But, uh, yeah. Thank you. That's really useful. Any other questions? Thank you, first of all, for having this tonight. This is great. Um, I was just curious, is this happening in the French immersion and the Montessori classrooms as well? Or what is that looking like? So in kindergarten, um, both French teachers are, are on board. Um, and they're, we're planning together. And we are writing together. Um, and so uh, we are, that's full momentum, for sure. Um, Montessori, in particular, has a different philosophical approach to, um, to play. And what I mean by that is, so um, in uh, Marie Montessori, um, whatever year she had started, back in the 1900s for sure, um, her whole component was really prescribed play. So she, while it's very developmentally based, she'd allow children to interact with the materials in, within their own developmental stage for the length of period of time in which they felt was necessary for their own, to vet their own feelings around play. She would craft the materials in which they'd play with create that moment in almost a finite way. So that is in direct comparison to the play-based instruction that's happening in the classrooms currently that I just shared with you this, e this afternoon. There's no right and wrong way. It's just philosophically different. Um, that's why there's Montessori materials. Um, that's why you know there's um, fine motor activities. And all of it is grouped out developmentally. But the constructivist model, as I had uh, shared with you earlier, does not exist in Montessori. Um, it exists um, in the play-based experiences that I'd shared with you earlier. 
the, uh, the French teachers, I'm not sure what program you're, but they're a part of our, the traditional French teachers are, um, have a smarter goal this year around yeah. play. That's true. So. I, yeah. Hi. <laughs> um, thank you all for doing this because I think it is wonderful and I'm delivering some strategies at home to my husband for this too. Um, but I didn't realize walking in here, like I was thinking more of like my children at home but I work in Wayland as a teacher and I am like so fascinated by this because we do have a maker space but we, the kindergarten teachers all the time are kind of talking about and frustrated with how to infuse the common core and that's so much, you know, so much during the day that these six year olds are doing, five and six year olds, that it's just the anxiety and the social and emotional learning. So we're trying to like do professional development around how we can reduce that. Um, so I know you haven't done it for too long, but have you seen a difference in children's anxiety levels um, that typically might have high anxiety during the school day, but you've seen a difference or? So as an early childhood educator, I think um, we have to protect kids against um, that kind of feeling uh, about being wary about their school and academic environment. So I say that very clearly, right? And I really mean it, actually. Um, and so uh, I think that over time, I think we will potentially see, I mean, the research does show that more chi if a child has develops that inherent worth, knows how they feel about themselves in a multitude of different environments and has the experiences to prove it, um, then they'll begin to exemplify it. And I'm sure Dr. Cohen could speak more about this for us, but um, then we'll continue to exemplify that in, in, in a multitude of different ways, in a multitude of different scenarios, just based in their own sense and ability. Um, so I think over time, for sure. But that is something, that social emotional learning component most certainly is the capstone to all of this. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think, you know, early childhood gives us such an opportunity. I led our conversations by talking about egocentrism. And really, that's just an opportunity to thrive within our environment. We're designed that way so we could survive, so we win, right? Mm -hmm. And so we're providing, we're cultivating that, actually. Um, and, then, and then as they develop, as children develop forward, we're creating the bridges to meet each other in a peer group and then learn how to navigate that situation. And all that is the facilitation of our teachers, of course. But over time, I think ultimately we should see um, some sense of decrease. And maybe not necessarily with the tip of labeling it as a less in anxiety, but more self-confident children. Mm -hmm. um, so thinking about it on that edge. Uh, I would absolutely expect to see less anxiety and more confidence as children own their own experience. And I think that a lot of anxiety in school is about do I belong here? Is there a place for me here? Am I good enough? Am I going to fit in? Is it too much for me? Am I being pushed at a pace that's not my pace? Yeah. Um, whether that's too fast or too slow? Is it the stimulation too much or too little? And when children are in charge in this way that you're describing um, and they're determining their own play to this extent um, that you don't have that, that pressure. Um, and I want to say something because I, you know, I know this event was co-sponsored by, by CPAC and um, I didn't talk specifically about special education needs and you, know, and you didn't talk about it directly, but it, this, uh, this model, this, uh, this approach is um, very, very much um, the, I believe, the right way to go for mm -hmm. all abilities of children and all needs of children. Play is really the place where all children live. It's this universal language. Mm -hmm. And children who um, can't walk can play. Mm -hmm. um, and they can't read, um, but they can play. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, children who come into schools that are, that are play-based like this can come in nonverbal, and their language develops around their play. You talked a lot about the reflection on the play um, and debriefing. And when, uh, if you just are quizzing children about things that don't matter to them, how are they going to, if, if language is coming with difficulty, how is it going to develop? But when children are, what they have to talk about is their play, and that's what people are, in, that's what the teachers are interested in talking with them about, 
the, the language really blossoms, and you, you see that in children who are, and the, you know, so those are just a couple of specific special needs kinds of kids, but it, mm -hmm. I really see that across the board. Yeah. Thank you. Hi. Um, are there plans to take this beyond the kindergarten classroom into the other lower grades? Yes. Um, as curriculum writing goes, it's slow and steady. Um, I like to really get things right, <laughs> and getting things right takes time. So it's a little bit messy right now. So the way um, the curriculum is, um, is written currently, um, we took about, I think there's seven or eight standards we actually um, dubbed um, from our Massachusetts framework. And so we built, um, in, we built those standards into our play. What I mean, now what we're doing is we're actually creating modules. So by, and what that means is there are four to five or maybe even six centers in some capacities in some classrooms. And um, we are building th with the standards, open-ended questions, um, and then uh, materials listing and those kinds of things. So by the close of the end of the school year, we will have a formal written curriculum um, around play based experiences and then once we have that then we'll be able to replicate it um, and there's lots of different ways to do that um, but um, with anything good that happens within a school system it um, teachers have to feel supported they have to feel like they're getting quality professional development that cultivates them forward um, and provide quality professional development really I mean at, at, the, at its simplest notion is a choice on the professionals part so um, it would be wonderful to see teachers holding on to this, seeing what's happening in a colleague's classroom and wanting to replicate it. And that written curriculum would be something that we then could hand off, um, then refine and redesign per the developmental scope and sequence for that grade level, um, uh, and then move on from there. Um, but the, the, the footprint is what we're creating um, this school year. So. Um, it's going really well, and it feels really good, too, which is nice to be able to say. So, yes. Great. Thank you. I just, I just wanted to um, add something. I appreciate what you were saying about um, that discord and conflict is OK, because I think it's just so common in early childhood education to step in, prevent it, um, and, and it's, I think the research has always been very clear that children need to argue and they need to work out their problems and they need to, um, to argue about rules and this is how they actually become moral human beings. And this, things have swung so far to adults intervening and children are doing adult-led sports as young as three um, and instead of arguing about the rules of their games and doing it themselves and leading it themselves. and so. I was really happy to hear about that. Any more questions? Okay, I just have one more for Dr. Cohen. Um, you've heard um, at what stage we are at here in Holliston. How does that compare to some of the other schools that you go into? And is there anything that particularly excites you about what we're doing here? And is there um, anything that you can give us in terms of advice or mm -hmm. steering in a, in a certain direction that we should have on our radar? For I think the, the range is steps. huge. Um, I'm, I'm very excited to, to hear about this. I think this is the future. I think this is the future of education. Um, and I see pockets of this all over. And, and I think it's going to then, as it grows, it's like, oh, wait, this, these people are doing this in China, and some people are doing this in California, and doing this here in Holliston, and, and it will grow. And I think that education kind of tends to go in pendulum swings. And so um, uh, I think that the, this, the swing towards the more play-based has often sort of not paid attention to research and sort of, and they're like, we've got to cram facts into kids as like, and then we'll do research. So then it looks like the research supports that. Mm -hmm. And I think that what having, you know, that you're doing sort of this ongoing um, research and going slowly and building it and seeing that it works um, is what is going to make this really stick. Yeah. 
Um, I, and I, I would just, I want to give a little, another plug for Anji Play because it blew my mind and I think that um, it's, um, and you know, to have, be happening in China where the educational system is extremely rigid. Um, and you know, you asked about, well, what happens in, in, in first grade and second grade? Um, in, this in this county, Anji, where they had this play-based uh, kindergarten, everybody said, well, it doesn't matter because they get to first grade and it's rote learning. And, and what happened was the teachers in the first, second, third grade started going to the kindergarten saying, what's going on? Our, these students are different. Mm -hmm. They're more confident. They're more engaged with learning. They're pursuing knowledge. Mm -hmm. We've never seen this before. They love being in school. Um, we've never seen this before. What can we do? And then they started saying, we want to bring this into these primary grades. Mm -hmm. And that's very exciting to me. And, um, and so you're, I think that that's in the future. I had, a, uh, <laughs> I had a first grade teacher, as I was saying, I have very few chairs in my room this year. I had a first grade teacher come into my room the other day and said, I heard you had cushions. And she said, can I borrow one of those? And so she said, I really, when you go for that grant, please let me, you know, they want. So they're, they're seeing, it's just, and I think Brad giving this, um, you know, just saying do what you want to do in your heart. Really be innovative, go for it. Um, for me to take the legs off my tables, that was a start for me this year. Um, and now we've gotten into just so many other exciting things. So I think it is extending out. Um, into some of the other grades. Fantastic. Is there anything that any of the panelists would like to add? I'm sorry. Anything that you'd like to add at all before we start to close? Mm -hmm. Any of the panelists? Yeah. Anyone? I just want to say thank you. Yeah. This is a wonderful opportunity to really showcase the things that we're working on. And even though they're really messy right now and um, not uh, completely book ready, um, it's something that we feel really passionate about. And um, we love your kids, and we love working with them every single day. They mean a lot to us. And um, we have over 750 children in that pre-K-2 school, and it is full every single day of so much excitement and so much interest in learning. And just to be a part of that every single day, really, it just means so very much. So thank you. Okay, so I'd like to thank our panelists for being here this evening. I think everybody's found it beneficial. And um, please share what you've learned this evening with your friends and your neighbours. The event has been recorded by HCAT, and I'll let everybody know when that's available and how to access it. Um, and thank you all for coming.